So, Dr. Catalin Brilla, welcome to our first official RIVE podcast. Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to, uh, to this exciting conversation. And um, I think the questions you have prepared and the topics are really relevant. Um, and it kind of sums up not just what I'm doing, but what uh, needs to be done in society, a lot of the things that um, lead to the underrepresentation of disabled people. To start, um, is it worth mentioning your, um, your book, uh, Documentary and Dis Disability? Can you tell me a little bit about that? The book, Documentary and Disability, is an edited collection which was edited by me and Helen Hughes from Surrey University. And it brings together academics, filmmakers, activists, um, and industry people, all talking about representation, disability, uh, inclusion, access, everything related to factory media, to documentary, different forms of documentary. Uh, the book was conceived because we thought that there's no real study of how factory media represents disability or includes voices of disabled people making documentaries, for instance. And uh, we thought it was time to, to address it because there's a, quite a strong kinship between documentary and disability, given that documentary has been used quite a lot to represent disability in very stigmatizing ways. And not just in terms of film, but also photography. Uh, you have this kind of um, photographs of otherness, of the other, of the disabled other, the exotic other, that constantly amplifies the uh, disability and spectacularizes disabled people and creates this kind of almost freak show, this display that's, that we watch, or like going to a circus. So factory media is, is very much responsible for that. On the other hand, factory media or documentary has the huge potential to um, break the stigma of disability. I think that the, the, the view on disability is, goes roughly along the lines of this, based on conversations that I have with people. Disability, what is disability? Well, first of all, there's got to be something wrong with you. Mm -hmm. That's the first part. Um, it's got to be a significant. So uh, perhaps it's got to be something along the lines of blindness, deafness, mm -hmm. or in a wheelchair. Uh, it's got to be, in that sense, it's got to be vis visible. We should be able to see what's wrong with you, right? I mean, how else are we meant to know what's, that you have a disability if we can't mm -hmm. see it? Um, it's got to be diagnosed medically. Uh, it's got to be evidenced. Um, and it's pretty much got to define who you are as a person. Well, I think, I think you summed it up quite well that this is the stigma of disability in today's society. And the root of this is really the way our brain works by constantly stereotyping other groups and labeling other groups and trying to create binary opposites between us and other groups. So, for example, um, the uh, disability attitude you mentioned is called an ableist attitude. So an ableist word means that disability is seen as a minority who is oppressed by, by the non-disabled people. And um, this happens through binary opposites in representations, in media, art, literature. So um, people constantly try to create these visions of disability that are dominated by otherness and otherness is usually visual so the more a body is deformed for instance or the more the disability is, is obvious the more this representation will prevail because it distinguishes us from them so in a way this kind of um, distinction between us and them is a way to affirm our own identity this is how our brain works so it seems almost like it has a functional purpose it has a functional purpose in terms of evolution because um, our brain constantly uh, tries, to, tries to label groups. So if I belong to one group, the identity of this group is identified through difference to other groups. Mm -hmm. So I identify myself, for example, as able because I'm different to disabled. But for that to work, the other group, like the disabled group, needs to be amplified to the binary difference. And this is one of the problems why we have this stigma in society because our brain thinks in stereotypes and processes the world in binary opposites, in stereotypes. So what you are referring to is called the medical model of disability. 
which is the model that sees disability as something that needs to be cured and treated and something which is a negative and a deficiency. Um, so this is a very typical ableist model that even though it has the name medical is also a very political model because it's about oppressing disability and I'm not saying people oppress disabled people um, on purpose but it's an implicit bias to just keep minorities down and, um, and um, self-affirm or affirm the identity of the majority. I wonder whether there's a, an element of consent on the part of the person that I have to recognize, call myself, view myself as someone who has a disability and mm -hmm. there are people with some conditions. There's been some research around mental health and also dementia um, that there is a sort of, there is a groups that are quite resistant to the mm. term disability. So in terms of some of those um, challenges uh, in terms of people being viewed as, as disabled, are there any that, that stick out to you or seem relevant? Um, yes, and I think this is the big tension that um, we have between the medical and the social model. So some people don't want to be um, called disabled, um, either because they don't um, see their physical disability as a disability or because um, they have a, an invisible disability which, uh, which society wouldn't recognize as a disability. So there are different reasons. Um, but yes, I think I think it's uh, something that is about this tension between is it negative, is it positive, or is, is it somewhere in between? And um, from the medical model we know that disability is something negative. The social model, on, on the other hand, sees disability as, as a construct by society, by an ableist society um, that wants to oppress disabled people and um, the social model basically says that uh, it's the fault of the environment and the way cities are built and, and, and architectures and so forth that disabled people are not included in those. So that model is equally problematic because it's very relativist. So it it's, it's, um, says disability is a construct. It doesn't acknowledge that much the um, problems that come with disability in terms of, of um, physicality or in terms of society. Moving from disability to documentary, um, what does that mean to you? What, what is documentary? So documentary is again a very contested term because it has changed historically quite a lot. So documentary, um, usually what people think it is, it's a kind of um, medium that represents real life and, and is, um, is truthful to a certain degree and tries to be objective to a certain degree because they see it as a binary opposite to fiction. And it's equally problematic, like you see disability as a binary opposite to ability, mm. because there's a lot of blurred boundaries between documentary and fiction, like there's between ability and disability. And that's why I think this book is trying to highlight uh, the similarity between these two terms being very complicated terms that defy binary opposites. So coming back to documentary, um, documentary is a genre, a media genre, media form, that looks at real life through a particular lens. I really like John Grierson's uh, definition of documentary being the creative treatment of actuality, which has been contested a lot even by himself and revised, but I think it's, it's pretty much um, a good working definition because it means that you look at real life, but in a very creative way, you narrativize it, you use aesthetic means, and inevitably you skew it somehow. So documentaries, are always mediations that are skewed perspectives of real life. It's never just like looking at real life through uh, a transparent window. When I read that quote in the, in the book, um, I was like, creative? What do you mean creative? You know, not being from the, the filmmaking background, it's, you know, it should be a, a factual representation. It's, mm. There was a sort of resistance in me to this idea that, that it, it should be um, creative. I guess that the tension within the field of uh, how much of this is factual and how much of this is creative. I think a lot of documentary filmmakers don't see this as a tension but as a potential. Exploitative, uh, you mean? Uh, <laughs> you, you could say that, you could say it's more exploitative, that's true. It, it is very prone to being exploitative, that's, that's true. But it's also very 
very prone to be instrumentalized as a positive aspect of documentary that helps you to convey certain emotions, certain experiences. So creativity through aesthetics, for instance, or through narrative structures is a, a really good way to convey human emotions and feelings, moods, experiences of other people. Um, so for example, with disability, documentaries about disabled people, I find it very important that a creative approach helps the audience understand the point of view and the experiences of disabled people rather than being this kind of dry factual approach where you look at the other because it is exactly this kind of factual dry approach that creates distance between us and the other between the non-disabled and the disabled so i think the creative freedom of actuality actually is quite beneficial to uh, to disability on the other hand it can also lead to more stigma and more sentimentalized representations and representations that uh, put too much emphasis on um, uh, Stella Young, a disability activist, calls it inspiration porn. <laughs> so basically yeah. it's, it's this kind of exploitation of anything that is conflict, anything that is inspiring to, uh, to an able audience show it. I love watching documentaries but often I, I do wonder whether it's more about the filmmaker than it, than it is the participant. Yes, that's and uh, I think I think you're right. A lot of filmmakers, um, many times including myself, we make assumptions about the characters we film, about audiences we, we expect to watch our films, and these assumptions are more informed by what we want and, and our own projections. We always project our own ideals and desires and stereotypes onto our characters. So I think um, as responsible filmmakers, we really need to question our own biases and assumptions. So the Terry Fragments, I guess my first question is, um, what was the point of that? So the, the point of... <laughs> <laughs> this is, yeah, this is a question, kind of, this is a question I ask myself but to, before I do anything. Mm -hmm. I think, but what's the point? I really yes. try to focus my mind. Yeah, so no, as every, brutal as it sounds... Every filmmaker loves this question. Really? Right? <laughs> uh, no, I'm being sarcastic. <laughs> now, to understand what the point of it was, I need to start from um, from 2004 when I did my MA and I made a um, documentary about a blind painter, the same blind painter, Terry, for my MA. And even though I have no disability in my own family, I wanted to make a film about a blind person who does visual art because I found it so interesting. This is where the conflict comes from. And and um, I was you know, completely drenched in these disability stereotypes and these biases that I didn't notice. So I made this film, which was highly stereotypical, and uh, it went to festivals. It was fairly um, successful in festivals, but even shown on, on TV. And then with time I realized, oh my God, this is actually very stigmatizing. So I have to redeem myself. So I embarked in a, in a PhD where I decided to make a, a longer film about him, which became the Terry Fragments, but a film that is informed by research on stereotypes and stigma. So the point was, in a way to redeem myself from my previous um, stigmatizing film, but also to make something that may um, contribute to changing attitudes in society towards blind people. Um, and thirdly, the third point uh, would be for other filmmakers to learn from my methodology, which, um, which can be found in my publications, how I made the film, learn from my methodology how to responsibly make films about disabled people, how to think about representation and stereotypes in documentary. So they were like these three points. Mm. You've given um, me the opportunity to, to watch it in full. Um, one of the things that I'm going to tell you my, in, my sort of instinct watching it, because I think it's quite telling. Um, so one of, firstly, I just thought this is fascinating. So I was sitting down watching it, I thought this is, this is Brilliant. One of the things that I really liked is it felt, and I don't know if this is actually true or not, if, if it's that, the creative element coming in, that it felt like um, the narrative was constructed by Terry, that he was in control of um, what, he, what he spoke about, how he spoke about it. It, I, I, it was very rare that I actually sort of heard you on, sort of ask him some questions. And, I, and that kind of, I was really interested in that part of it. That was one of my um, favourite things, but also the, the, the way that you filmed him it, um, was really nice, the combination of the, the visuals and the music. The other side is I thought, oh, why, why are these broken up into sort of segments? It sort of messed with my mind. Is, 
well, what's Catherine doing? He's, he's sort of breaking with tradition. This is not allowed. Like, what, mm. You know, what's he, what's he playing at? Like, and it, it was almost, I don't know if it was like, oh, I, I wanted to watch more of, of that segment or um, it sort of messed with my mind a little bit, the, the narrative structure where you sort of broke it down in different segments. Of course, I now know that that was on purpose. Um, so can you tell me sort of your, your sort of thinking about um, sort of segmenting different parts of, um, of Terry's life? Yes, so in a way this film is it's a bit of an experiment. It's a balancing act between trying to be uh, trying to be counter to the mainstream and, and, and avoiding stereotypes, but at the same time making it in a way that uh, a mainstream audience would watch because this is where you want to combat stereotypes. Um, so the segmented structure came from the idea that I didn't want to use a typical narrative formula with a conflict um, because that's usually more prone to stereotypes when you um, represent marginalized communities or stigmatized communities. And I also wanted to show the everydayness of, of Terry. So one of my main theories through my research uh, is that the best way to represent um, a stigmatized group in a way that avoids stereotypes is to show the everyday life of the character from their own point of view. And usually in everyday life it's quite episodic, it's very fragmented, we don't always have very neat coherent narratives, there's always interruptions, things in between certain developments, distractions, so I wanted to capture this kind of sense of, of everydayness. Um, so a lot of studies in anthropology and psychology have shown that the everyday is very episodic, very messy, very multi-rhythmic. So you have sometimes fast, sometimes slow rhythms, and that's why some episodes are very fast, some are very slow, some are based on interviews, some are based on observation. So I want this kind of multitudes of, um, of, of things. And also, there's a really good quote by Tobin Siebers, who is a disability scholar. He's saying that um, disabled people, like, like everyone, all the people are a work in progress. So I want the film to, to almost seem like it's an unfinished assembly of episodes without a narrative. It's, it's, a, it's a work in progress and it's not this kind of categorized, finite, um, defined character portraits. It's something that is completely open. Were well, you not influenced or so did you about how it will be, how that fragmentation will be received? Because I imagine most people, their focus when making film is like, how is this going to be received? I guess you've gone with your intention, you've had a, a, a clear purpose to it, but did that ever kind of, were you ever concerned about how, how the viewer would receive it? Oh, definitely. Uh, I'm very concerned because all my work um, is about spectatorship and how my films are perceived, or films in general, are perceived by an audience. So, um, one thing that I predicted was that the audience would be annoyed <laughs> not having a narrative and secondly not seeing the finished painting by Terry because it just finishes in the middle of, of, of him painting it and we have several episodes where we see the painting process but we never see the finished painting. So uh, I, I knew that would happen and I, I knew that this would kind of shock an audience who is used to mainstream narrative formulas with a neat ending but my theory is that this kind of annoyance will make the film look more, maybe more realistic or um, it will be hopefully um, longer in their memories because they will think about it and they will see Terry as just an everyday person who creates art but we don't necessarily label him as an artist because we never see the finished painting. Were you ever concerned about sort of overplaying or underplaying disability? Was there ever a tension there? Yeah, there was a big tension in this and um, through my research, my theoretical research, I was trying to find methods to um, solve this tension. So one, um, one strategy was, for example, to um, not focus too much on the painting process. But if you focus too much on the painting process, you automatically have this experience of a blind person doing visual art, so the disability is usually foregrounded, especially because of the way he puts together the plasticine and the paint through touch and things like that. 
So the painting, I want it to be almost in the background, like a background narrative that doesn't have a beginning and an end, it's just there. Uh, another strategy was to use um, scenes in the film or episodes that have nothing to do with his disability. So for example, scenes where, um, where he's either doing a crossword puzzle or where he's, um, he's uh, writing a poem or, or playing his guitar. So things where the disability is actually quite in the background. It doesn't have any bearing on what he does. But at the same time, we can't or we should normalize disability or, or ignore it. So there are also scenes where the disability is very much in the foreground, where he talks about it, where he talks about being blind and being frustrated, or when he bumps into my camera, for instance, because he can't see me. Mm. So that's there as well. So it's, it's again this kind of balance between the disability being um, neither foregrounded nor pushed into the background. It's, it seems like a really difficult balance to get right. It's very difficult, it's very difficult, but I found that the best strategy is to look at um, everyday life and to look at Terry interacting with objects. Because mm -hmm. sometimes when he interacts with objects, you don't see the disability and sometimes you do see the disability. So for me, objects and the materiality of space has a very powerful um, aura in terms of, of, of complex characters. Will a project like that, or Terry's Fragments, will it ever achieve sort of mainstream or commercial success? Um, or is it sort of confined to um, the realm of sort of disability filmmaking? And if, if not, why not? Have you got any thoughts on that? Well, it's, that's one of the biggest tensions of my work. and. Um, Obviously, my work aims to break stereotypes or to challenge disability stereotypes, and that's only possible in a mainstream audience. There's absolutely no point making an experimental film that breaks stereotypes and showing it to experimental film audience because it won't really have a huge bearing on the mainstream where the stereotypes really are. So yes, the point is to, to make this as, as mainstream as possible, but at the same time um, break mainstream conventions like through the narrative. So it's somewhere I would say awkwardly positioned on the periphery of the mainstream, not in the center, but nor, nor outside, but on the periphery. And it's a really difficult balance as a filmmaker, which I'm still struggling with. And one way to reduce this, um, this issue or this tension was to make a film which is very much based on counter-narrative and, and, and counter-representation, counter-mainstream, but at the same time use marketing materials like trailer, synopsis, a poster that do capitalize on stereotypes. And that's a big ethical um, struggle within myself. So for example, when I created the poster for, for the Terry Fragments, I, I had a long chat with my poster designer, who obviously is a very professional poster designer. He makes a lot of mainstream posters. And I told him my vision of the poster according to all my methods to break stereotypes. And he said, well, if you do that, no one will watch the film. Because, mm. you know, I want it to be a poster that doesn't have the word blindness in, in any, any title, that doesn't show Terry's face or eyes or anything like that, that is about everyday life. And he said, well, no one will watch that. There's no audience. Exactly, there's no audience. So you have to show what makes him different. Mm. You know, typical stereoty stereotypical thinking, but um, he was right that this was the only way or the only way to kind of attract a mainstream audience to watch something and then even though the poster may be quite stereotypic because on the poster, I don't know if you saw it, but uh, we can see a close-up of Terry's face, we can see that he's blind, um, the, the tagline has the word blindness in it, it's... Mm. Uh, the whole emphasis is on um, the experience of touch by seeing his art, so it's, you know, things that you wouldn't see that much in the film, but it helps to um, to attract, hopefully, to attract a more mainstream audience to watch the film. So I think there's, there's this kind of necessary evil where you do have to use certain stereotypes in order to bring the audience to an experience that may break these stereotypes. And my wish would be for charities and for fundraising campaigns to use similar tactics where um, they do 
use stereotypes, but but in a way that leads to something something better. And I think that's a very difficult, uh, very difficult um, balancing act, and it's a very much of an ethical struggle for filmmakers because, in a way, your merchandising, your marketing materials don't fully reflect your film. They only part to reflect the film. Well, they part, they reflect the current climate. They, they reflect and, the current climate and they only show one side of the film, which yeah. is a kind of compressed side of, 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 of uh, the stereotypical aspect of it. You're kind of like luring people into the pub with cheap drinks and then when they turn up, they're like, hold on a second, this is not what I've been promised. Yeah, and then you give them orange juice, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. In a way, that's, that's, that's exactly it. Um, so if people want to um, view or find out more about Terry Fragments, where, where do they go? What, how can they find out? more watch it watch clips so there's a website called the terry fragments um, where you can um, see the trailer and you um, have more information about terry more biographical information and there's also on the same website there's a whole section about his painting process where you actually can see his finished painting ah. so if you go there after watching the film you have the pleasure to see the full painting in its glory